Good morning, New Hope. It is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. You know, I, I love this time of the year because we get to take a special time just to recognize moms. And did you know, by the way, that I know that Mother's Day, like the day of Mother's Day, is kind of a man-made thing. But did you know the, the idea of honoring mothers is a biblical thing? We're supposed to honor mothers. We're supposed to honor your father and mother. So this is a wonderful day, and I am glad that you're here on Mother's Day. If you're a mom, uh, we welcome you. We have a gift for you before you leave, and so we want you to take advantage of that. Uh, so happy Mother's Day to you. You know, usually on a Mother's Day, when you hear a Mother's Day message, it usually has something to do with how you can be a better mother, how you can improve your mothering. And usually, uh, pastors will go to something like Proverbs 31 and show the picture of this perfect woman. And you think to yourself, oh my goodness, I could never possibly attain that. I could never possibly achieve that. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have those sermons where they're talking so much about how wonderful mothers are that you think, man, you know, I, I, I don't know if I live up to that standard. And so it's interesting because about five years ago, I, I delivered a message on Mother's Day and I had someone ask me, would you share some of those concepts today on Mother's Day? And so I'll be sharing some concepts with you that are a little different from what you may normally hear on Mother's Day. See, we all have this image in our minds of what a mother is. Every single one of us has an image in our minds of what the ideal mother is is. It comes from maybe our own moms, or it comes from the TV and the media we've watched. It comes from whatever, wherever we got these ideas of what a mom looks like. And so we strive to live up to that. And the problem is often it's an image that is unrealistic. It's an image that we strive to live up to, but we never quite get there. And so I don't know if you're like me, but I know around Father's Day, here's what happens in my mind. Around Father's Day, I'm excited that the kids finally, you know, uh, get some time to spend with me and all that. But honestly, what I start thinking of on Father's Day when my kids are honoring me is I start thinking, you know, I've really messed up. I've really made some mistakes as a father. And I start going over in my mind all the things I could have and would have and should have done right, but I didn't. And I don't know if it's any different for you, but on Mother's Day, maybe some of you are out there right now. Maybe you're thinking... You know, I didn't live up to this standard. I didn't quite live up to the expectations that I had for myself. Or maybe the expectations that my husband or, or, or my children had for me. And so this Mother's Day, rather than share with you something like Proverbs 31 and encourage you to try to live up to that, I want to share with you this Mother's Day, a mess for Mother's Day. A mess for Mother's Day. Because you know what? All of us, all of us come to times in our lives when we find our lives are a mess because we're all messed up in our own special way. So for this Mother's Day, for this Mother's Day, I want to share with you, not the Proverbs 31 woman, but another woman from Scripture. Another woman who is actually held up as being an example in Scripture. This is a woman who we are supposed to look up to, look to as a role model of being a wife, a role model of a mother, a role model of faith, a role model of following God. And yet, I think we'll see an interesting story as we look into who she was this morning. Sarah. Sarah, the wife of Abraham, the mother of Isaac. Sarah is commended in the New Testament for her faith. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about her great faith. It, uh, 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 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 5 talks about her, how wonderful of a wife she was, her submission. Genesis chapter 12 speaks of her as being a remarkably beautiful woman. And you think, what kind of a... Of a, of a uh, role model is this to live up to? I mean, she, she was faithful and, and, and she was this perfect wife and, and she was beautiful and all these things. But the story goes deeper. Scripture says not only was she a beautiful woman, but 
I believe she was also a feisty woman. I don't know if any of you guys are married to a feisty woman. But I believe this woman was a feisty woman. We see the examples of it in Scripture. But also, it's interesting to note that the name Sarah has two possible meanings. It could mean princess, or it could mean argumentative or feisty. Isn't that interesting? Now, as Christian women, of course, you're all soft-spoken and not feisty at all. I get that. But if you can just, you know, stretch with me here for a moment, okay? Sarah is this feisty woman. And Sarah was a very, very flawed woman. She was a flawed mother. So let's follow her story this morning, shall we? Sarah was a flawed mother with a flawed husband. A flawed mother with a flawed husband. Genesis chapter 12, verses 11 through 13 says this. And when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. Now, if Abram had any brains, he would have just stopped right there. That was good enough, okay. But he had to, you know, continue the sentence. And said, when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is my wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say, rather, that you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. Do you see Abraham, the father of faith here? Look at this. I mean, this, by any standards, he is not looking out for his wife. He's certainly not walking by faith here. He ends up doing some horrible things at the cost of his wife. So I want to tell you mothers out there right now, you mothers and you wives, I want to tell you, listen, there are no perfect husbands. No perfect husband. Abraham, the father of faith, was far from perfect. Far from perfect. There are no perfect husbands. And if you are looking at your life and considering your life today on Mother's Day, and you're looking about you, and you have this image of perfect motherhood and perfect life and perfect family in your head, and you're looking to your husband, and you say, wow, well, he's got some real issues, though, so it doesn't quite live up to my thoughts in my head. Can I tell you that you are in good company? This There are no perfect husbands. And if you're looking for your husband... To be perfect, if you're looking for your husband to be your source of fulfillment, if you're looking for him to be your source of joy and your source of peace and your source of happiness, then what you've done is you made him an idol. He can never live up to that. He, your husband, hangs on God's grace continually, just as you do, just as I do. So be careful not to make an idol out of your husband, not to expect too much from him. He is flawed, and if you have a flawed husband, welcome to the human race. So Sarah was a woman who was flawed herself, and she had a flawed husband. Not only did she have a flawed husband, but she was a flawed mother with a flawed family as well. She had a flawed family. The, as the story goes on, Sarah gets older and starts becoming desperate about the fact that she is not does not have a child. Some of you know this pain of wanting a child, not being able to have one, maybe even on Mother's Day. Sarah let this pain consume her, this obsession consume her, to the point that she would do anything to have a child. Now, by the way, let me just tell you that to want a child, it's normal, natural, nothing wrong with wanting a child. To need a child, that's idolatry. There's a difference. If you say, I must have this in order for me to be fulfilled, then you've created an idol. In Sarah's desperation to have a child, in Sarah's desperation to have a child, she did the unthinkable. She told her husband, uh, Abraham, to sleep with her servant girl, Hagar, in order to have a child through her. And in Genesis 16, 4, we see Hagar, the servant girl, ends up looking down on Sarah as inferior horrible relationship in Genesis 16 6 we say Sarah kicked out uh, or we see Sarah kick Hagar out and eventually she returned in Genesis 21 9 through 10 we see the teenage son 
becomes such a disruption to the peace of the family that Sarah eventually ends up kicking him out of the house along with his biological mother. Now some of you may have experienced the pain of having to tell a teenage son or daughter to leave because their attitude was so bad that it so poisoned the family that it could no longer be taken, no longer be tolerated. Sarah had a flawed family. Can you relate? You know what a marriage is? A marriage, a marriage is two sinners coming together, sharing life under the same roof. That's what marriage is. You know what a family is? Family is a bunch of sinners sharing life under the same roof. It's a mess. Any way you slice it, it's a mess. Your spouse and your children rely on the mercy of God at all times. And if you need to have a perfect family, then you've created an idol. Because you'll never have it. It's interesting to note how all of us have these visions of this perfect family. We, we want that. We crave that. We long for it. We desire it. You see it around Christmas time. You see it around Thanksgiving. The idea in our heads of this Norman Rockwellian scene where everything is perfect and the presents are wrapped just so and the turkey is sitting on the table and everybody's dressed and the children are polite and everything is beautiful and it's utter fantasy. It's utter fantasy. And there are mothers right now, perhaps listening to this at this moment, that are being crushed by the guilt of their imperfection. The imperfection of themselves, the imperfection of their husband, the imperfection of their family, imperfection of their children. But we see that Sarah was not only a flawed woman with a flawed husband and a flawed family, but she also had a flawed faith. A flawed faith. Genesis chapter 10, chapter 18 rather, verse 10. Genesis 18 verse 10 and following says, The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. And Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure of having a child? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, No, but you did laugh. Do you see what Sarah's doing here? This example of faith. She is doubting God. She is doubting Him so much that she laughs at the proposition. And then as if that were not bad enough, she lies about it. How's that for an example for you? Sarah is this model of faith. And yet she had imperfect faith. She doubted God. She lied about it. Did you know that even the idea of our faith can become an idol if we don't look at it right? If you feel like you need to be perfect or you need to have perfect faith, then you've created an idol. What kind of idol? The idol of trust in yourself rather than reliance upon, upon God. Trinity University recently conducted a study on stress levels of students. And they took some of the brightest girls from Ivy League schools around the world and they did a survey. And it turned out that most of them were very stressed out. Some of them utterly crushed under the, the pressure and the weight of trying to maintain a, a 4.0 grade point average, to be accepted socially in their college setting to fit in. But even more interestingly, the study found that those girls who were devout Christians 
were experiencing even more pressure from trying to not only juggle their school and their relationships, but also trying to maintain their relationship with the Lord, whether it be through daily Bible reading or joining numerous Bible studies or, or whatever it is. They felt this weight, this pressure crushing them, this burden of, of, of perfectionism that no one can attain. And some of us are dying in that place right now. Feeling guilty that we haven't achieved it. Now let me step back for a moment and tell you what I'm not saying. We are not saying by any stretch that you should not continually strive to be more like Christ. You should. Absolutely. Try to be more like Christ. We must. But understand that at your Christian best, you are completely reliant upon God's grace. Not only for your salvation, but for your growth and maturity. Understand this. We never, ever, no matter how long you've been a Christian, you never, ever move beyond this point. See, some of us think, oh, eventually I'll move beyond that. We never move beyond that. You will never move beyond grace. Ever. We will always live by grace. Romans chapter 5, 2. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. See, this stress that people are under all the time, this weight, it's consuming them. And if you feel like this gal sometimes, I want you to consider the power of this passage. Listen to it again. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So the grace by which we begun is the grace by which we now stand. And we will ever continue by that grace. So here's Sarah, a flawed mother with a flawed husband and a flawed family and a flawed faith. And so you say, okay, so help me to understand this. Like, are you saying that we shouldn't try so hard? Yes and no. Let me break it down for you. It goes like this. Many of us understand that we need to be imitators of Christ. Scripture says that, right? So here's what we do. We go about it from the outside in. We figure that if we change our external behavior, that things will eventually turn so that we will become and look and think more like Jesus. The truth is that will never ever happen. Because what that is, is trying to be like Jesus in your own power, and you will never, ever do that. It's impossible. The only way to be conformed to the image of Christ is to allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through you. So it's not a change from the outside in. It's a change from the inside out. Jesus said, cleanse the inside of the cup, and the outside will also be clean. So stop focusing on all the externals. You say, well, what do I focus on then, pray tell, if I want to be a little bit more like Christ? Simple. You focus on Christ. You be still and know that I am God. You spend time with Him. Have you ever... Uh, have you ever noticed that the people that you admire most in life are the people that you spend the most amount of time with and consequently you begin thinking like them and acting like them and talking like them. Listen, you want to be like Jesus, you spend time with Jesus. You ask him to transform you supernaturally from the inside out. So what I'm not saying to you is, oh, don't try to be like Jesus. That's the farthest thing from what I'm saying. I'm saying try to be more like Jesus, but don't do it by your own power because it's impossible. So, Here's Sarah, a flawed person, a flawed mother with a flawed husband and a flawed family and a flawed faith. But there's more to the story. Because it ends in a very interesting way. Because she also has a flawless Savior. The next passage I want to show you is remarkable because it helps us to understand the rest of the Bible. This is kind of the theme of Scripture. Galatians chapter 3 verses 8 through 9 
And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, revealed the gospel to Abraham in advance, saying, All nations will be blessed through you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So Abraham, this messed up guy, that did all kinds of horrible things, failed miserably on a number of counts, with a flawed wife and a flawed family and a flawed faith, God used him to work through him because God has this tendency, you know, to use the weakest things to do the greatest through. And God used him and revealed the gospel to him in advance, saying, all nations will be blessed through you. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham the man of faith. What is Paul saying? Paul is saying this, that the gospel, the very good news of salvation itself by grace through faith, was announced in advance to Abraham. 2,000 years before Jesus was born, Abraham and Sarah knew that God would send a redeemer, a savior, and that salvation would come through the grace of God, not by being a perfect mother, not by being a perfect follower of God, not by being a perfect husband, or having a perfect marriage, or perfect family, or a perfect faith, none of that. It was by God, by grace, through faith. And Jesus deals with all the ways in which Abraham fell short, and with all the ways in which Sarah fell short, and he also will deal with all the ways in which you and I fall short. That's the good news. They were saved from their flaws and imperfections in the same way that we are. And the way that we stand as believers today, right now, is the same way we came to be believers, by grace through faith. Nothing ever changes. And it happens and it starts when we begin by surrendering our lives to God, trusting in Him to save us, and, here's the key, resting in His power and promise. Resting in His power and promise. You know, it's funny, we mentioned, uh, we mentioned Sarah laughing. Do you know later on in the text, the text again mentions Sarah laughing? But this time, she's not laughing at the prospect of her having a son in her old age. She's actually laughing when her son is born. G Genesis 21.5, Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. And everyone who hears it will laugh over it. Laugh with it. See? Once she laughed at God's promises, now she's laughing because she sees God's promises. Not a sarcastic snicker of doubt anymore, but a sincere laughter of joy. Knowing that in spite of all of her flaws and all of her husband's flaws, God was faithful to fulfill his promise of salvation. What did she do to obtain it? Nothing. She didn't have to accomplish or achieve or prove anything. She didn't have to become a perfect mother. She didn't have to get her life straight first. She didn't have to clean up her act. She just believed and she trusted in God. So there is a central theme in Scripture. There is a central theme in Scripture. And that is that salvation is from the Lord by grace through faith, not of works, so that we would not boast. We can't earn our position with God. Can't do it. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't try to be a godly parent as a mother or a father. It's a wonderful thing. You absolutely should try to model Christ to your children. But I want you to understand this, and especially for you parents who may be right now dealing with a child who is wayward. Listen to me. You can have two children raised by the exact same parents in the exact same way, under the exact same roof, and they go polar opposite. little thing called free will. Stop beating yourself up over that. The way your children turn out, while you can influence your children, certainly, but you can't change them. You can influence them, but you can't change them. Just like you can't change anyone. You can't change your husband. You can't change your wife. 
You can influence. You can't change. So regardless of how your children turn out, you have an influence on them, but you cannot be responsible for how they ultimately will turn out. Some of you have come to feel that the way your children turn out rests on your parenting and you are beating yourself up over it every day. And every time Mother's Day rolls around, those thoughts creep into your head. I'm here to tell you stop. Be at peace. Some even feel that your own child's eternal destiny somehow rests in your hands. That's crazy. I can't even save myself. How can I be expected to save anyone else? I can't be responsible for my children's salvation. I can be responsible for what they do while they're living with me under my roof, absolutely. Once they're their own, they're their own. Between them and God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. So see, to be a Christian, to live a Christian life is not to be proud of, of, of what you've achieved or accomplished or somehow think, oh, I'm better than the next guy. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's to be more humble. Humble before God and humble before your fellow man, recognizing that we need and rely on His grace and mercy, not only for our salvation, but to make it through every single day. Humility, relying on God's mercy and grace because we're all messed up own special way. Me first. So for you moms out there today on this beautiful Mother's Day, if you are feeling increasingly guilty or increasingly crushed as this idealistic vision of motherhood or family it, it, it is, is like it's slipping through your fingers. Somehow you feel like you, you failed. Somehow you feel like you can't do the un, undo the past. Can I tell you, be encouraged today. Be encouraged. You're in good company. The outcome of your life does not depend on you being a perfect mother or having the perfect support of your husband or on the harmony of your home or upon being the perfect Christian or having the perfect faith but upon God's grace through Jesus Christ alone. That's it. So be at peace. I want to leave you with a thought. I want to perhaps on this Mother's Day change the way you think about yourself, the family around you, and perhaps even how you think about God. I want to challenge this morning. I want to challenge you to consider how you view what God expects of you and what God expects from you. What if God told you who you are? That in Him there is no condemnation. No judgment. No rejection. What if God told you that He loves you? And that He will never stop loving you. What if God told you? That He doesn't keep a log of past offenses. Of how little you pray. Or how often you've disappointed Him. What if He told you that you are righteous? Because of His righteousness. Right now. What if he told you to stop beating yourself up? That his grace for you abounds, even when you think the most horrible thoughts, because you are already made in his image. What if he told you that if you repent, and if he's your savior, you're going to heaven? No matter what. What would your life look like then? If you stop trying so hard. And just let God live his life through you. Grace. Mercy. Forgiveness, salvation, redemption through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are loved. We are saved. Now let's live it like we know it.
Can I encourage you this Mother's Day, rather than trying to pretend everything's okay, rather than trying to have the perfect family and the perfect home with the perfect husband and the perfect children, can I just encourage you to acknowledge the mess that you're in on Mother's Day? To acknowledge the mess and to rely upon Jesus. To tell him this morning that you know you're a sinner, you know you've, you're saved only by grace through faith, to thank him for his mercy through Jesus Christ, to thank him for being the God that you can rest in and trust in, right beside your flawed husband and with your flawed children and your flawed home, with your flawed faith and your flawed brothers and sisters in Christ. We can trust in the midst of all that, all those flaws, all those failures, in the midst of them, we can still trust a fabulous, flawless, faithful Savior. And that Savior this morning says to you, says to all of us, come to me, all of you who labor and who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is burden. My burden is light. You don't have to do anything. Just rest. Just trust. Just abide. Be at peace. Happy Mother's Day. Oh, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for redefining our expectations this morning. Our expectations of you, our expectations of ourselves. Lord, thank you for revealing to us the fact that we can rest and trust in you. That you have finished the work. That by grace through faith alone we come to you. And by grace through faith alone you have saved us. And by grace through faith alone we will stand until the end. And by grace through faith alone, Lord, you give us mercy for every new day. And Father, I especially this morning lift up those mothers out there who have been laboring under the weight of the burden of failure. Whatever that failure may look like to them. Lord, I ask that you release us from that. Release us from the burden of ourselves and our own performance and our own failures and flaws. Help us to look to you for our comfort. Help us to look to you for our salvation. To you for our sufficiency. For our joy for our peace, for our hope. Because truly, Lord, you have come to set us free. We thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for setting us free. In Jesus' name.